No course on sociocultural perspectives, the history of the 19th century free African American community would be possible without Dr. Lois Horton and Dr. James Horton. I'll tell you a little bit about them and you'll know precisely why. Lois Horton is presently professor of sociology at George Mason University. Professor of history, it changed. You see, they tell me nothing. <laughs> professor of history at George Mason University. Um, what you must know about uh, these two is that uh, they have uh, Brandeis University in common and have spent a good deal of time here in Boston. They wrote together black Bostonians, family life and community struggle in the antebellum North and in hope of liberty, culture, protest and community among northern free blacks, 1700 to 1860. Uh, Jim and Lois have, have a number of projects together, not the least of which is marriage. But they also um, uh, have spent time together uh, at the University of Hawaii, is it? And oh, there'll be uh, John Adams Fulbright chairs. Uh, this is the first time that uh, there, there will be two chairs. And uh, Lois will be in Amsterdam and uh, Jim will be at Leiden. Jim is the Benjamin Banneker Professor of American Studies and History at George Washington University and Director of the African American Communities Project of the National Museum of, Afri of American History at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. Um, what I also want to say about these two unique people is that they make this history um, this sociology um, accessible. They are a dynamic duo that are really so very important to the history of this museum and its historic sites possible. They have brought a level of scholarship and are um, this seminal work about black Bostonians is something that we carry around here um, like some sort, you know, so, like an instructional manual. Everyone must read it. Everyone must begin to understand this history. So I offer to you this morning the doctor's court. Well, thank you very much. I want to start by talking a little bit about how we came to do this work. And believe it or not, we did this work in the mid-1970s. We were children at the time. <laughs> um, actually, we got involved in looking at the black community in Boston before the Civil War as a result of the sociological, social policy discussions that came out of the 1960s. You may remember this. Uh, the Moynihan Report, which looked at African-American families and theorized that African-American families were weak, that black communities were splintered and disorganized, and that that weakness and disorganization could be traced directly to the impact of slavery, that slavery had destroyed the concept of family in black society, the concept of community. And uh, part of the reason, this report argued, that we were having such trouble with race in the 1960s had to do with slavery before the Civil War and the impact of slavery and poverty on black people. One of the reasons we wanted to look at Boston in the era before the Civil War was to test that theory. I mean, after all, Boston's black community was not a wealthy community. It was a poor community. Many of the people who lived in the black community in Boston during that time had come directly out of slavery. And so if you were ever going to see the effects of disorganization, disunity, weak structure as a result of slavery, you should see it here. What we found surprised us. I might say shocked us. This community was unbelievably organized. In fact, at first I thought we were doing something wrong. I kept thinking, well, maybe this organization is more on paper 
than in reality. But as we looked through more and more documents, as we gathered more and more information, it became absolutely clear that the building in which you are sitting was the center of a tremendously organized, a tremendously active, a tremendously supportive community. And so then our question was, how did this happen? It's out of those questions that we came to write the book Black Bostonians, which incidentally was originally published in 1979. It has been reissued. In fact, it has been reissued for its 20th year anniversary. But at any rate, that's the starting point. Now, what we want to do today is to talk in two parts. One, we want to talk a little bit about how we went about doing the research, looking at research sources, things that you can use in your classrooms so that some of your students can do very similar research of wherever your classroom is located. And then we want to talk a little bit about the community itself and the kinds of activities that the community participated in. Lois is going to start out first by talking a little bit about some of the documents we used. One of the things that happened to us when we started doing this research was that people, scholars, would say, it's not possible. Not only did they say there was no community, which was a discussion we had over and over again, uh, but they said you couldn't find out about it. People didn't write, leave letters to the Boston Public Library, most of them in the community. People didn't have diaries. They didn't do all the things that wealthy people do to document their lives. And they said, so there's no way you can know. Well, we decided to take up the challenge and started out with something that's familiar, I think, to, to people who've done genealogical research. We started out with the United States Census. This is sort of the building block, the foundation block for the study of, of any population group. Uh, census started, of course, in 1790 as a simple head count. By the time we get to 1830, 1840, you'll see there's a bit more information, although you'll also notice you get the head of family, so you, you know the names of the head of the household. You get a lot of, well, relatively speaking, a lot of information, age groupings for whites, right? You'll notice at the top it says free white males, free white females. Over here we get a count account of slaves in that first column. I know you can't read it all, so don't worry. Account of slaves and account of free colored, it says. So early on, at least, you, you get some basic information. The last column there is foreigners not nationalized. So you get some basic information about how many people there are. It's really a little bit later when you get to 1850 and 1860 that you can do a lot of interesting work from the census. The 1850 census, you'll see, gives you now the names of everyone in the household. This is just a form. We'll, we'll look at this in a minute. But people's names, age, sex, color, occupation, also the value of the real estate they hold, their birthplace, whether they've been married, whether they're in school, if they can read or write. So already a fair amount of information that you can glean. You'll notice that you have a listing of people in households. You don't, it doesn't say relationship to head of household yet. All right. There are ways that you can extrapolate that information. When we did it, we found, we experimented uh, by looking at the 1860 census and then looking at a later census, and we found that by noticing the patterns in which people were recorded, we could deduce relationships and were accurate about 98% of the time. So there was a very common pattern. They list the head of the household first, the wife next, the children next. If the, one of the children is older, they list their marriage partner before the smaller children. You know, so they, they kind of keep families together. So you can, you can figure that out. 
By the time you get to the 1860 census, it's pretty much the same, except you'll notice there are two col columns for property. In 1860, we get real estate and personal property as well. So now you can do a good deal of more information about what people own and relative wealth in the, pop in the population, about class, you know, whether there are groupings of elites who hold property. What we found, you may remember, in black Bostonians is you couldn't predict who was likely to have wealth or property based on their occupation. Now, there were some people who were servants who had a good deal more property than other people who were professional people. Now, you can begin to speculate again about that, and it's kind of fun for students to think, okay, you know, how does this servant, who may have been a household servant for 25 years, end up with a good deal more property than the, the hack driver? Well, it seems clear, <laughs> but it would be an interesting exercise for them to try to analyze those patterns. Now, that's the 19th century and the kind of information you can get. Of course, by the time you get to 1900, if you want to do 20th century, then no problem. There's anything you want to know. This is actually the very beginning of what's called the social statistics movement in, in the US. And so they wanted to collect a lot of different information. You can also see from the 1900 census a good deal more information about nativity, where people were born. Not only where they were born, which you can tell from the earlier census, but where their mother was born, where their father was born. We're heading into a generation later a lot more restriction on immigration. And you can begin to pick up the concerns of the society about immigration with this census form. Also about levels of poverty and wealth. We've just gone through a period here where, you remember the Gilded Age, yeah? Where there's great disparities in, in wealth and poverty, all the robber barons and such. And so the government begins to be concerned here about relative economic standing. And so you get a lot, of, a lot more information about whether people own their home, whether their home has a mortgage or not, whether they live in a farm or a house, then if they can read lots more detailed information. And it only gets more and more detailed as we go, for, as anybody who's filled out the household survey for the census form now knows, right? A good deal more information. But this, this is how we start looking at the community, using these census forms, the manuscript census, as our building blocks. Now Jim will show you how hard that is to do. As you can see, our technological setup here is very interesting. And I'm going to be walking around, turning on things, turning off things. Um, if you can turn off the overhead, and I'll see if I can reach the slide projector. Now, I know you can't read this very well, so I'm going to talk to you and try to explain some of the things here. This is the U.S. Census filled in for 1860 for Boston. The, the thing that's very interesting here is, if you can see at the bottom, we have some uh, groupings outlined. Uh, basically, what we wanted to show there, information about place of birth. Place of birth is very important because this gives you some idea of the regional origins of the people who are living in the community. We, uh, after we did the, the study on Boston, we did a study of several northern black communities uh, all over the north, uh, New York, Philadelphia, and then in the Midwest, Cincinnati, Chicago, a variety of places, all the way out to San Francisco. And one of the things we were very interested in was the populations of these cities and how they compared in terms of regional origin. And I'll tell you why that's important in just a second, but let me just run through the regional origins first. In Boston, 
we found that most of the people in, in the black community in Boston were from Massachusetts or New England. Then a secondary group from New York and Pennsylvania. Very few of those people were from the South. If they were from the South, and this, this group will show this, and I will explain it because I don't think you can read this. If they were from the South, they tended to be from the Eastern South, that is from Maryland and Virginia. And so what you have here is a community basically of New Englanders or Northerners with a few Eastern Southerners thrown in. Eastern South, but the Northern regions of that Eastern South, basically Chesapeake region South. Um, the thing that's, uh, that's particularly interesting is that if you look at the birthplaces of the children and you look at the ages of the children, it'll tell you something about the migration of the family. At least you know about the migration of the mother. And uh, so we were interested in looking at those, at those patterns. One thing other uh, that I'll show you before we move to the next slide is above the outlined household, you'll see some people born in Ireland. Of course, this is Boston. What we found was there was a great deal of residential integration between African Americans in Boston and Irish in Boston because they were all at the same end of the economic scale. And so we all know about the almost legendary competition and sometimes hostility between the black community and the Irish community. But here's another side of that. They were also neighbors. They were also people who lived together, sometimes even in the same home, in the same houses certainly in the same neighborhoods, certainly across the street next door. These are people who associated with one another on a daily basis. This is the walking city. That means any place you went, you walked. As you walked, you saw people every day. It wasn't going out, getting in your car, and driving off <laughs> anonymously. So that as you think about those residential patterns, think about what that meant for the patterns of interaction. So that certainly there was competition. Certainly there was some hostility in some cases, but there was also daily interaction. That we found very, very interesting because, as you might remember, we were writing this book in the 1970s when that interaction between blacks and Irish was particularly topical at that moment of busing and that whole controversy of the 1970s. Um, I have a few other slides I'll just run through very quickly. Here's a slide also you can't see very well, and I apologize for this. But um, this is a slide of 1860 Cincinnati. Now, those, the household outline there, a black household, if, if you can't see the birthplaces, let me tell you, Mississippi. We have people born in Mississippi, people, the, the children born in Ohio. We have one uh, person born in Virginia. But again, the patterns of migration are important because if you look at a city like Cincinnati, I would argue, have always argued that Cincinnati is a southern city in a northern state. Most of the black people born, I mean most of the black people living in Cincinnati in the middle of the 19th century were born in the south and many of them born in the deep south. So that these people tended not to be so much Chesapeake region people as deep south region people. Now that becomes important because the culture of the Deep South is in very many important ways different from the culture of the Chesapeake region. Um, and again, I'll get to that in uh, one other uh, second. The thing, well, you can't see this either, but take my word for it, the people in this black community in that, on that slide are listed under race as M meaning mulatto. If we can go back for a moment to the Boston slide, the people in that group are listed B, that is black. Now that doesn't mean that there wasn't a mulatto population in Boston, of course there was, but it was a minority population within the African American population. In Cincinnati, it was the majority population within the African American uh, community. So that, so that, um, so that the shade of color really makes a difference in terms of 
the structure and function of the community. I just wanted to say a couple words about color, because I think it's, it's interesting to begin a discussion with your students about color. You'll notice that white people don't have anything in that column, right? It's blank. There's a presumption, right, about who you are and what color you are. The other thing is, how do they know, how do they decide, the census takers, who's black and who's mulatto, right? What mulatto has a particular meaning, it means mixed in some way. Do they ask the people? Do they just look at them? If the people aren't all at home, how do, do they decide, you know, this person must be married to someone that looks like them? Do they ask? You know, the very interesting questions that you can use to teach about color and color in society and what it means. And in terms of what color in society means, very quickly, let me just tell you, and we can talk more about this. We're going to have a period where we'll have some conversation on this. Um, what you'll find is in southern-like cities, these are cities in the north, they're not necessarily uh, southern cities, but cities in the north that have large southern populations. In southern-like cities, African-American communities tend to be more likely organized by color than in non-southern-like cities or northern-like cities like Boston. So, for example, to be a mulatto in Cincinnati means more than to be a mulatto in Boston. Th that's a really complex and very interesting distinction, and I want to spend some time talking about that, but we'll go on, and, and if you've got questions, by all means, raise those questions. Uh, this is a slide from 1850, Washington, D.C. Now, Washington, D.C. is kind of an interesting cross between Boston and Cincinnati because your migrants tend to come from the Chesapeake region. Uh, they tend to come from, as you look there, most of the people there are from Washington or Maryland or Virginia. The other thing I'll just mention very, very quickly, the last group towards the bottom, you'll see that there are uh, the, the man who is the head of the household, uh, J.W. Ball, is born in Virginia, his wife born in Virginia, their son, uh, their daughter born in New York tells you something about their migration patterns. Obviously she was in New York uh, 11 years before that census because it's, the, the, the daughter is 11 years old born in New York. And the other thing that's interesting is they have a border with them born in Virginia. That's a pattern. That is, if you're boarding with a family, you're more likely to be boarding with a family that you have had some prior connection to. If you're, if you're from Virginia, you're more likely to board with a Virginia family. It might be a relative, might be a friend from Virginia, or it might be someone who has gone on ahead and someone from Virginia says, hey, I know somebody in Washington, in Boston. When you get there, they'll put you up. So that boarding patterns all become very, very important. But again, regional patterns really tell you quite a bit. And we spent a lot of time looking at regional patterns. Um, what we'll do is to move on to another kind of record, which is very, very important. And uh, Lois is going to talk to you a little bit about city directories. But first, if you would turn that off, please. I just wanted to show you something very special about Nantucket. This is part of the manuscript census from 1830 in Nantucket. And you'll see a very famous person, Absalom Boston, at the top. This is 1830. Now remember what I told you about the US census, right? That you couldn't tell relationships. 1830, you didn't have everybody listed. The Nantucket census did list everyone. Right? And so you can go to the manuscript census and find households. You see Absalom Boston and Hannah, his wife. You've got a lot more information very early. Nantucket did a, started with a head count, um, but their first census counting blacks was much earlier than the federal census. It was 1764. So you have a lot more information to work with. By the 1820 census, there were 274 blacks in Nantucket. Um, it's a manageable size. You, you actually could work with some of this manuscript census material with your students. 
Now, there's one other thing I wanted to say about what you can find in the census. You'll remember, perhaps, that there is this column at the very end called Remarks. And you find you can find some very interesting information under Remarks. If you want to find out about boarding houses, for example, people will be listed. The boarding house keeper will be the first one, and then the boarders will be listed in a whole list, boarding with. If you want to find out about crime, there's a kind of snapshot. At the time that the census taker is going around, they go to the jail, and they list the people in jail, and they list what crime they're in very often in for. So you can get a sense of what people were put in jail for. Poor houses are listed in this remarks column. So if there's an asylum for the poor or a workhouse, you'll be able to, to find who's in there. Hospitals. Census taker goes to the hospital, and not only do they list who's in the hospital, but they'll list what they're in there for. So you can find out about diseases. You know, you, there's a great deal of information. It's not, of course, a census that tells you who's been in the hospital all year and, and who's ever been in the hospital that year. But you can see at that particular moment. And if you look from year to year, of course, it gives you some comparative information for understanding changes in the community, changes in poverty, who's likely to be poor and put in the poor house. Sometimes you find people who are, uh, have property in one census and are in the poor house in the next. You know? and, and it's then an interesting way of talking about mobility. Was all mobility upward in America? We know it wasn't. There was as much downward mobility. And this is a good lesson for people. Okay, now to city directories. The city directory is another kind of information that you can use. It has, this is a city directory from Boston in 1825. It has a good deal of information, but it also has certain biases. City directories were put out privately. They're, think of them as business directories because they really were put out for the purposes of the businesses, the local businesses in the community. And so what you'll, you're likely to get is a more emphasis on middle class and above. All right? So there are many people in the black population who will not show up in a city directory. It's sort of a hit or miss. But you'll also notice some interesting things. People are listed as, for example, uh, Ellen Barbados is a widow who lives on Belknap Street, formerly now Joy Street, who lived on this street. Sometimes you'll see widow of and her hus former husband's name. But it provides a lot of useful information in terms of occupation, where people live. It also gives you, for example, uh, James G. Bar Barbados was a hairdresser, his shop was on Brattle Street, you see, at 40 Brattle. His home was on Belknap Street. So for business people, you often get both their business address and their home address. It's very difficult to, to feel confident that you've actually found all the poor people in the community because we know that from census, federal census to federal census, in that 10-year period, about a quarter of the people typically at the bottom of the society move out of a community looking for work. This is what Thurston called the floating proletariat. And so if you're trying to trace people from census to census, census, it's difficult. But you can get a very good sense of the relative standing of people in the communities by looking at a census. And you're going to lose the poor people many of them, both in the city directories and in the census. Now, what happens, there's an interesting thing that happens in Boston. 1848-49 is the last census where people are actually identified by color. 
This is where the researcher feels very ambivalent about progress. Yeah? <laughs> then we don't know. After that, then we have to find them in other ways and know what color they are. Yes. <laughs> I lost you for a minute. Yeah. Let, let me just explain that having this microphone makes it very difficult to interrupt. And, and part of what we do is interrupt. Um, one thing that is, I think, important here, and that is the use of different records to complement one another. Now, the census gives you a lot of information, but until 1880, the census does not give you street address. So, for example, you can know what ward a person lives in. This was Ward 5. So if, if, uh, if a person lived in Ward 5, you knew they lived in the Beacon Hill area across Cambridge's Ward 6. So um, this, this is um, the Senate city directory then gives you street address. And that combined with the information that the census gives you, gives you a lot of information you can work with. So uh, again, combining these records is really important thing. Yeah. Well, just a second. You, you can also notice perhaps one good thing you get from the city director is a sense of different occupations, right? You see there are a lot of sailors here, mariners, um, a lot of laborers, a number of people who run boarding houses. Very often those are for sailors as well. Okay, so you're likely to also see that kind of thing in Nantucket. But if we look at other cities, this is a city directory from Washington, D.C., and you can see that life there is somewhat different. Here you get government workers, a clerk. Here, Washington does their racial designation differently, you'll see. They, they put colored by the name. And so what you've got is a man, Stephen Ambush, who's selling oysters on a corner near the Capitol. You also get institutions, right? The American Colonization Society has their headquarters there, the American Telegraph Company. So it's very interesting to compare different cities by looking at the city directories and seeing the kinds of opportunities, kinds of occupations that are available to people in different places. Okay, so city directories and census. These are very, two very important sources of information, but they're other important sources of information. And I should tell you that we discovered these as we went along. This is literally true. We'd look at one thing and, and, and we would find another kind of document and realize that that document had something that the documents we had been previously working with didn't have. And we, it was very much like a jigsaw puzzle, trying to put these pieces together. One of the things that becomes very important, and you probably know some of this, is the use of wills in inventories. This is an inventory from a man whose name is Edward Ambush who lived in Washington, D.C. When you died, often the tax recorder would come to your house and go through all of your personal property and value each piece, and that would determine the taxes that you owed on your death. Uh, inventories can be very, very important. And these are some interesting ways of interpreting inventories. You know, if you look at the second line there, you'll see that Edward Ambush had a lot of chairs, 11 chairs. That's interesting. Wealthy people have specialized pieces of furniture. They have sitting room chairs and dining room chairs and specific and dining room tables and in tables. Working class, poor people, they have, they have tables. They have chairs. And so that's one way of looking at the level of society that you're looking at. The other thing that's very interesting is we were, we were very interested in the fact that Edward Ambush had so many chairs. People who are community leaders tend to have lots of chairs because they have meetings at their houses and they have to have chairs for people to sit in. Later we find out that Edward Ambush at one point was, had given a speech before the U.S. House of Representatives. 
He was a leader in the, in the Washington black community. But again, that's the kind of thing you can speculate about by looking at the inventories. Inventories are very, very important. Realize that the single most valuable part of his inventory was a large family Bible worth $20. If we could find that large family Bible, we could find out a lot more about that particular family. But again, that's a clue. Now you know that there's a large family Bible to look for. And again, inventories can be very, very important. And also, wills. This is Edward M. Bush's will. This will was made in February of 1864. And uh, it can tell us a lot about this particular person and his life. In this will, he leaves some property, that a uh, house that he owns in an alleyway, to his son. That tells you something about his, his being a property holder. Incidentally, Edward Ambush started out as a slave. We first picked him up in documents written by his slave master saying that under certain conditions, when he sa saved up a certain amount of money, he would be granted his freedom. So we know that he started in slavery. Uh, we also know that by the end of his life he was a property holder because we can see that he leaves property to his wife and he leaves property to his son. So he's done pretty well in the period of about 20 years between the time he was freed and the time he died. The other point I want to make is if you look at his signature on the right hand side of the page you'll see it is an X. He's illiterate. And if you look at the signature at the bottom center it's, uh, the signature of Greenberry Solomon, also an X. That's interesting because Greenberry Solomon is a witness to the will. Here we can talk about social networks. You don't just grab a person off the street to come in, witness your will. This is a person you know. And so th in this way, you can start to look at community relationships. We talked about the viability of community and the viability of relationships within that community. This is one of the ways that you start to try to understand those relationships. I have a couple other slides in that I've just put in because I think they're really, really interesting and I'll try to relate them generally to what we're talking about. This is a freedom paper. This is something that blacks in Boston did not need so long as they stayed in Massachusetts, in New England, in the North. But if they went into the South and they did not have a freedom paper, they could be at risk. This is a freedom paper of a, a woman from Washington, D.C. And I just put it up there as an illustration of the, the precariousness of life even for free blacks. Without this freedom paper, in the South, you were assumed to be a slave. That was a dangerous position to be in. Maintaining your freedom paper was very important, so important that you kept it in a waterproof, fireproof case. This is a case, actually this is on display at the uh, National Museum of American Historians, uh, National Museum of American History at the uh, Smithsonian. It is a case from that period, a case that people often would keep their freedom papers in. Your freedom paper might be recorded to the courthouse, but courthouses notoriously burned down. If the courthouse burned down with your freedom paper, the only copy of your freedom paper in it, it was a personal disaster. And so safeguarding that freedom paper yourself was very, very important. I was doing some research recently on an article on kidnapping and fugitive slave rescues, and I ran into an interesting story about freedom papers. The small and Bates account, the women who came on a ship from Maryland to, to Boston and, and were protected from slave catchers, they had freedom papers. But according to uh, Robert Purvis in Philadelphia, freedom papers were often used by a number of different people because, he said, since all black people seem to look alike to, to the authorities, they could get away with it. And in the Bates and Small case, I found information that there was, in fact, a market woman in Baltimore who had a kind of business of providing freedom papers. And so people would come and use their freedom papers to get free, and then they'd send them back to them, and they'd be used over again. You know? So it was sort of the freedom paper bank. You know? <laughs> there are other kinds of... of um, documents that 
we'll just talk briefly about. Uh, tax records are useful, too, if you want to find out about ownership, property ownership, and relative uh, economic standing. Of course, the traditional vital statistics, births, deaths, marriages, you know, those things tell you something. Once you've got a picture of who, this, who the people are in the community, you can get a sense of change over time. Siemens protection certificates, which serve a similar function. Sailors who went into the South were often at risk of being uh, sold into slavery because they had to be jailed in many ports uh, so they didn't infect the slave population with ideas about freedom. Um, so Siemens protection certificates were very important. Also, one that we discovered that's getting a, a, a good deal more use in the last 10 years or so, Civil War or and Revolutionary War pension records. Pension records are incredible sources. This is as close to you as you can get sometimes to a diary for poor people, uh, to finding out about everyday life. If a woman is widowed, she has to prove that she was married before the war, before her husband died, right? And so what she's likely to do is get her neighbors to come in and give depositions to testify. And you can find out things like, oh, yes, we knew John and Mary. They came over to our house every Friday night to play cards. You, know? you get a sense of people's lives, sort of the everyday life. Uh, also, you know, people who are applying for disability pensions bring in their friends to, to give testimony as to what they did, were able to do before, and then, you know, Joe came home from the war and he was never the same. Uh, he couldn't walk to work where he worked down at the docks, and you know, it was just too far for him then. So you get a lot of information there that you, you don't get anyplace else. Now, there are also more traditional uh, documents that once you have this picture, a profile of the community that you're studying, that help to tell you what these people are doing. Organizational reports. There are some. You know, we said this, these communities were very organized. And not only were they very organized, they became parts of networks of organizations. And they made reports on their activities to often to the headquarters of organizations. And, and they used these as recruiting tools, too, right, to tell about what they were doing. Okay, the other thing you, we can use is newspapers, even the Liberator, or maybe especially the Liberator. The Liberator, we all know, is an anti-slavery newspaper, but it was also a community newspaper. Uh, and that was true of Freedom's Journal, other kinds of newspapers as well. The Liberator would carry notices of meetings. It would carry notices of musical events in the African Meeting House. It would tell you who was playing what instrument in the band in the musical events of the African Meeting House. So we know that you know Howard the Barber was in a band and what he did. And, and sometimes it would even tell you what music they played. It would tell you if the you know, Garrison Juvenile Choir was singing at, at some kind of event. It would tell you that, and it would even tell you how much it would cost to go and see them. You know, so a good deal of information about the community and, and what they're doing. The other way to find out about activism, what people are doing, are broadsides, right? Those things that are posted around the community to mobilize the citizenry. This was in response to the Fugitive Slave Bill of 1850, and it was a declaration about their opposition to the Fugitive Slave Bill, often signed, in this case, by Lewis Hayden and William C. Nell, two community leaders. Another way of tracing community leadership and what leadership is doing. Or the notice of a public meeting. You, you find in an archive a notice of a public meeting, and you can begin to look for more information on these meetings, what's happening. They're responding, of course, here to the Dred Scott decision. It's interesting, too. This is Charles Ramon and Robert Purvis. Robert Purvis is from Philadelphia. So one of the other things you can find out from things like this is – 
the networks of activism. Ramon from Salem, Purvis from Philadelphia. Somehow these people are all connected in this effort to protest the Dred Scott decision. So each document, if you read it closely, can give you clues to reconstruct the activities of these people in 19th century communities. One of the things now that um, becomes obvious from the work that we've done is not only was there a viable community, but the community was connected to other communities. It wasn't isolated. And so we started to think about a whole network of communities. As I said, we started out doing Boston. But as we saw broadsides like the one that shows you that uh, Ramon from the Boston area is in Philadelphia talking to Philadelphia blacks, that Robert Morris from the Boston area is in New Bedford or go out to Cincinnati or various places, we start to understand the ways in which these people are connected to one another. Newspapers are a tremendously important part of these connections. In fact, it's very interesting that you can find, in fact, I remember seeing an ad in the Boston newspaper where people from Pennsylvania, from Pittsburgh actually, were trying to contact people in Cincinnati. And you're thinking, and so they put the ad in the Boston newspaper? Well, sure, because these newspapers made the rounds. I mean, this is the closest thing to television, to, you know, CNN. This was a way of keeping people in touch with one another. And of course what we're talking about here is not only a community, not only a viable local community, but a network of communities. Now what we'd like to do is to take a moment and answer any questions you have about this and then we'd like to spend just a few more minutes talking about the ways in which this community structure helped to support community activism. Do you have any questions about anything that we've said? And if so, we can we can uh, talk a little bit about it. Yes. Okay. So so your question is about the way in which newspapers and and the importance of newspapers. What that tells us about literacy rates. Well, it's very interesting because that was one of our questions as well and. Um, let me just tell you that Boston's black community was a highly literate community. You realize in 1860, the literacy rate among blacks in Boston was about the same as the literacy rate among whites in Virginia. Boston's black population was a very literate population. Or maybe I'm saying something about the literacy rate in Virginia. But at any rate, it, it, they, they, there were a lot of people who could read. But now this is one of the things we found, and that is there were places, and here we come into... Uh, just starting to touch on the importance of community institutions. African Americans in Boston ran lots of small businesses, barber shops, grocery stores. Obviously, the church was a very important uh, community institution. In these institutional places, there were often the reading of newspapers. And so if you went to, to uh, Peter Howard's barber shop, uh, you might very well be there when the newspaper was being read. And especially this was true as the fugitive slave law was passed in 1850. Everybody was really concerned about this law which threatened the security and the safety of every black person, slave and free. Or when the Civil War was coming, or when John Brown's raid was underway. In other words, especially at the critical news moments, the newspaper was read in, in a variety of places. And so, therefore, it is certainly true that the, the, the literacy rate tells you a lot about the extent to which news could be dispensed, but, but to make up for that, there were these readers that uh, were kind of the bearers of news. Yeah. Yes? Jim, in the city directory where it listed occupations, I didn't see any mention of domestic workers. Yeah. The, Absolutely. In fact, the largest single occupation for women was domestic servant. The problem is that for women, often, there was no occupation listed in the census. Now, that, is, that comes out of 
middle class expectations about the role of women in the 19th century. And where it is certainly true, the cult of true womanhood, which was this um, theory which supposedly um, provided roles for women in the 19th century. That cult of true womanhood, that was, you know, the woman's place was in the home. A woman's place was to raise the family, to take care of the, the house, and so on. Well, that's great, so long as your, uh, your husband has the economic wherewithal to allow you to do that. But for most people in the black society, and in fact many people in Boston below the, the upper classes, that was, it was not possible for women to, to just remain in the home and do housework for themselves. And so especially for black women, uh, domestic work was very, very important. Yeah. yeah, you find that more in the census because the city directory, as I said, was a business directory, and people were not necessarily looking for servants that way. They would be listed as, as domestic servant in the census, and that's where we find them. It's also interesting about the, the number of women or the percentage of women who were working in the black community. I think we theorized that this is what gave black women a different standing in the household because their economic contribution to the household was so important. It also gave them a different standing in institutions. Black women could speak out in public long years before it was acceptable for white women to. They played a very different role in the household and in the community. And I think part of it was because they were so also economically important. Not only could they speak out, but in many cases they were expected to. And, and last thing, in the, sense, in the uh, city directory, as you, I don't know if you remember one of the slides, but there are very few women listed because city directories tended to focus on the heads of households. And city directories tended to have information most about the males in the households. Or if you were a widow, you might be there. But even widows, they're not, as we look through city directories, we know that there are a lot more widows in the community than there were listed in the city directories. But as Lois said, the census then was really important for giving you a sense of women in the community. But um, even in the census, often you'll find a woman listed with no occupation. And you know from other sources that the woman did have an occupation. Yes? Mm -hmm. Sure. The, the question here is research. Um, on not only migration patterns, but the choices that people made, why people went to Cincinnati or, or Boston and so on. What our research shows is that people tended to go to places where they knew people, where they had contact. You know, chain migration. By the way, this is not only true for African Americans. It is no accident that there are lots of Irish people in Boston. Boston attracted Irish people because there were a lot of Irish people here. Chicago in the late 19th, early 20th century attacked, uh, attracted Italian people in large part because there were a lot of Italian people there. It's a chain migration, and that is that people go to places where they know they'll find support, where they maybe have uh, family members or community members from the old country or the old community. And so what you find is part of the reason that you get such a large, deep south black population in Cincinnati is because up the Mississippi River, through the Ohio River, you're in Cincinnati. And that's the, 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 the travel patterns, the transportation routes. One of the reasons you get people from the east coast of the south in Boston, right up the east coast, you, you take a, a, a coastal boat, you know, uh, mainly in the 19th century, traveling by water is often safest and most reliable, and therefore water transportation up the Atlantic uh, coast is, uh, is the way that people made the trip. And so that's part that's a partial explanation uh, for the migration that you find. Okay. What? Yes. Sure. The question is. The, the question is, can you take, can you combine the city directory with the census and actually plot people on the street to find out how densely people were grouped? And yes, you can do that. And the other thing you can do by using the city directory is to, to figure out the route 
of travel of the census taker. Because see, sometimes, and you can see it, sometimes the census taker went across the street like this, back and forth. Sometimes they'd go down one side, across the street, and up the other side. Well, you've got to know that. Otherwise, you don't know who's living next door to whom. And in fact, we, we had this study that we called the Near Neighborhood Study. And this was a study where you would take a house, and then you would take through using the city directory and the census, you try to identify the people on either side, the people directly across. Basically, you try to identify the people in direct line of sight on a daily basis. And then you try to see what other kinds of connections you find between those people. And what we found is there's often lots of connections, even when those people were of different races. Even when those people were of different races, if they lived across the street or on either side of one another, they were often working in the same area. Maybe not in the same business, but in the same area. They often went to the same barber shop. They often went to the same church. They were often in the same organizations. Again, this near neighborhood study tells us a lot about how people made decisions to join, join various things or go various places. And in some ways, you know, they're, in many ways, they made decisions just the way we do. You've got a friend next door, and they say, you know, I go to this meeting all the time, and it's so interesting. You ought to come sometime, so you go. So it, that's, that's a very interesting and, I think, important way of understanding the social interaction and, to get back to your question, to understand how closely people are living with one another. It's also a very labor-intensive study. <laughs> Yeah, that, that is one thing we must point out. Uh, we, we didn't say this. We, we started out coding from the U.S. Census every black person listed in the U.S. Census in Boston for 1850 and 1860. That was for black Bostonians. Um, we did a, a book that came out in, seven, in uh, 97 called In Hope of Liberty. In that book, we had coded 40 and I can't remember the precise number, but over 40,000 people from a variety of cities. Luckily, we didn't do it all ourselves, but our graduate students really did help us out. But basically, what you do is you go through that census, and you take the information from the census, you put it in a form that can be read by computers. And let me tell you, since we started in the, in, in the mid-'70s, computers have advanced a great deal since we started, so now it's a lot easier to do it when, than when we first did it. Because we first literally do it, we would write them in little boxes and then have to transfer it from, I mean, it was labor intensive to say the least. But this is the way you can find out the answers to some of these very important questions. And it's a way that you really can start to understand how communities work, how people work with one another, how they interact. Yes, one more question and then we're going to go on to talk a little bit about activism in the community. Yes. You know, a lot would depend on the issue. Um, for example, John Morris, I'm not John, no. Robert Morris. John Morris is a friend of mine today. <laughs> Robert, Robert Morris is a friend of mine 100 years ago. Uh, Robert Morris was a black lawyer, but many of Robert Morris's clients were Irish. In fact, they used to call him Morrissey. <laughs> he, was <the> black <laughs> he was the black Irish lawyer, right? At any rate, so, I mean, there were these kinds of interactions, and around certain issues, you did find alliances. Unfortunately, around other issues, mainly economic issues, you found real competition and sometimes even hostilities. Um, the, the school and the school integration issue is one uh, particularly. Yeah, this changes over time. Um, Sailors very often had a, a sense of, of community, especially early on, lived in the same places, worked, of course, on, on the ships, and that created a kind of bond. Um, when you find interracial marriages, you find them between blacks and Irish, you know, much yeah. more often in Boston, much more often than any other kind of interracial marriage. So the yes, <laughs> the answer is yes, mostly. <laughs> Yeah, because people lived together, they shopped together, they did all the things. You know, there were separate black organizations, 
And so their whole lives weren't integrated. And of course, the Irish were likely to go to different churches. And since the church was really the center of the community, uh, it, that created some kind of separation. The, the greatest integration was at the bottom. Saloons, <laughs> gambling houses, you know, that's, that's where you find the integration. Well, OK. Let's talk a little, bit, a little bit about what these people organized to do. We spent the first part of our research trying to find out about the structure of the community. Once we found out about the structure of the community, we then started to understand that the structure and this really solid community was the thing that made the activism in this city, African Americans in conjunction with lots of white abolitionists, part of what made it possible was the strong, structured African American community in the city. The thing that they were most concerned about, there were lots of issues, but the thing that they were most concerned about was the issue of slavery. Keep in mind that by 1860, 90% of African Americans in this country were slaves. That means that if you are a free black person, the chances are that you had somebody, a friend, a relative, mother, father, sister, brother, somebody in slavery. It would have been almost unthinkable that free blacks, any place in the country, would not have been concerned about the abolition of slavery. And as we move towards the Civil War, as we move through the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, the thing that we're finding is that slavery is becoming more and more powerful more and more powerful economically. And because it's becoming more powerful economically, it is becoming more powerful politically. Let me give you some examples, because people don't understand. You talk about slavery being important, and people think, oh, well, yeah, sure, there's some plantations in the South that have the gone with the wind mentality about what slavery looked like and so on. Let me explain to you how important and how powerful slavery was economically. This is important, by the way, if you're, if you're uh, thinking about structuring an American history course, and you're going to look at the 19th century, and I know lots of people who tell me I'd love to talk about slavery, but you know, I just don't have time. I got so many other things that are important to talk about, I just don't have time to get it all in there. I want to tell you, leave out the Constitution. Because slavery is central to everything American during this period, including the Constitution. Incidentally, let me just point out that you will, that slavery was the topic too hot to handle for the Constitution. You look in the Constitution, you will not find the word slave or slavery until you get to the 13th Amendment in 1865. It's too hot to handle, to put, to put into the Constitution. You have euphemisms. I like to have a, 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 a portion of the Constitution which is, has a provision for returning fugitive slaves. But they don't say returning fugitive slaves. They say... A person who owes service to a person in one state cannot escape that service by removing himself to another state. What they're talking about is fugitive slaves, but they never use the word slavery. At any rate, slavery becomes increasingly important as the South expands southward and westward. That is, with the Louisiana Purchase, it becomes part of the United States in the early 1800s as the South moves into that area, into what is now Arkansas and Louisiana and Mississippi and so on, as it moves into the southern half of that Louisiana purchase, that is a place where cotton can be and is grown. And with the technological advance of the day, I'm now talking about the cotton gin. You think the computer makes a big difference in our lives today? The cotton gin revolutionized cotton production. With a cotton gin, one slave could do the work that had formerly been done by 50 slaves, which made slavery really, really a valuable institution. It made cotton tremendously economically important and powerful. What it means is that by 1815, cotton was the most valuable thing this entire nation exported to the world. By 1840, cotton was more important than everything else this nation exported to the world put together. By 1860, the value of slaves was greater than the value of all of America's banks, all of America's railroads, all of America's factories put together. 
We are not talking about a marginal institution here. We're talking central. And as, as cotton became so important, you realize that we produce seven-eighths of the world's cotton in 1860. Think about what that means to the cotton textile manufacturing in Manchester, England, in France, in Germany, in New England, Lawrence and Lowell and Waltham and places like that. Cotton was tremendous. You know, part of the reason that the South thought that it was viable for them to secede from the United States and to become an independent nation is because they were the OPEC of cotton for their time. Well, as cotton and slavery became more and more valuable, the South, the cotton-growing South particularly, became more and more powerful. You realize of the 72 years between the election of George Washington and the election of Abraham Lincoln, of those 72 years, 50 of those years saw a slave holder in the White House. We're talking about real power. By the time of the Civil War, slave holding interests had allies, that is, people who were allied to slaveholding or were slaveholders themselves, in the majority Supreme Court of the United States, holding chairmanships of every major committee in both houses of Congress. One wonders why the South wanted to secede. They could just take over the country. Not quite true, but you can see that slavery, cotton production, Slave interests were very, very important. Now, I make this point to you because I don't want you to think that becoming an abolitionist was kind of a thing you thought about doing on the weekend. This was a really serious decision. And for African Americans to be involved in this, knowing how precarious even free blacks were, that was a very difficult decision to make. So that is a backdrop. Let's talk about some of the things that were done in the activist aspect of the lives of free blacks in Boston and other places in this region. What I'd like us to, to think about is how these handful of people, basically, kept this campaign against discrimination, but especially against slavery, alive for such a long time. Now, you remember, of course, that blacks in New England started campaigning against slavery before slavery was ended in, in Massachusetts even, right? The petitions, the slave petitions, uh, petitioning the courts. Uh, and so there's a very long history here of agitation, of organization, of asserting rights. And it's that already ongoing anti-slavery movement that Garrison joins. And I think it's really important to remember that. He comes into a place that's already organized. Right? He gives it a wider voice. He connects them to more resources. But there's already a base for, for organizing. And it's, it's really quite remarkable. When you think about the voice that, that Boston, as the hub of New England, had and other communities in New England against slavery, it's remarkable. It was a poor community, right? They have very little in the way of economic resources. They, three quarters of the people worked at unskilled and semi-skilled labor. They were very unsteady work, right? Many, many were day laborers. They came from a lot of different backgrounds. Some of them, you know, right out of slavery in the South. You had lots of fugitives who were still technically slaves who could be enslaved at any time. You know, the slave catchers could have come and, I guess, theoretically gotten Lewis Hayden. I wouldn't have liked to try it, but, you know, they could have. Um, he was a runaway slave, a fugitive. And so when, when Hayden helped fugitive slaves by sheltering them, when he took the crafts into his house and you know, boldly asserted they were there when the census taker came. You go to the census and you see, you know, Hayden's household, and there are the William and Ellen Craft right there. It doesn't say fugitive, but it might as well. I mean, they were very well known. He was putting himself at risk, too, right, because he, he also was a fugitive. So you had many different backgrounds. These people shouldn't have been able, from everything we've thought about, uh, 
organizing, community organizing, and resources for community organizing. They shouldn't have been able to do this. How was it that they were? I think uh, there are a few clues if we look at the records that we've been examining so far. First of all, we're talking about an urban community. Right? We're talking about people who moved as slavery ended in Massachusetts into settlements, more concentrated settlements. More concentrated settlements make families possible, which was the major impetus for doing this, but also makes all kind of community organizations possible too. It's much harder to maintain cultural organizations um, educational organizations, even churches, in a, a more dispersed population. All right? So the concentration of population gives them a kind of power. Also, New England was relatively free right? from the beginning. People could protest. They could petition the legislature. They could sue in the courts. They could vote. They could go to school. This is a quite a difference from a lot of places in the country during that time. So this provides them with tools for organizing and the ability to use them. The liberator that we've talked about was really important to their ability to connect themselves to other communities, to other like-minded people. It became sort of the national black newspaper uh, in addition to Freedom's Journal and, and the Colored American. It got a lot of attention. The other thing, of course, that, that Garrison's activism and relationship with the community did was bring other people with resources into this struggle and connect them to the black community leaders, right? Uh, Wendell Phillips, Theodore Parker, others who, who had a larger pulpit and more money. Higginson, who took a very active role was also, as we mentioned before, a literate community. That meant that all of these handbills, newspapers, could be effective in mobilizing the community. You didn't have to talk to each person to get them to turn out. You could put up a handbill and people could read it. You could find out. It was all over the North. Um, it's amazing. When you mobilization of communities in response to captures of fugitive slaves. You know, it's doesn't take more than a half an hour most places before you can get a couple of thousand people together you know, to protest, to try to break somebody out of custody. You know. So the, the network of communication is, is very effective. And part of the reason it's effective is that there's this dense network of organization. In Boston, we saw it with boarding houses where people from occupational groups very often live together in boarding houses. So even at the household level, people are organized. If you have a boarding house full of sailors, it's easy to get other sailors, right, out to turn out to help rescue someone, probably a sailor, who's been captured. And you remember the story, I think, in, in Black Bostonians where the boarding house owner is the one who spearheads the effort to get a sailor out of jail in the South. And he writes to his boarding house owner, and he's the one then who can go to the Massachusetts authorities. But that's his connection to the community. That's where he can mobilize his resources. When we're talking about sailors, we're talking about people pretty much at the bottom of the society with very few resources other than their friends. We also had, of course, mutual aid societies. Even this was part of the cooperative tradition of African societies, right? You saw mutual aid societies, some of the first organizations formed in, in every black community. But mutual aid societies did a lot more than provide for widows and, and orphans and sick people um, who couldn't work. They also all spoke out against slavery. They also engaged very early in this fight against slavery. So practically any organization in the society that you find, fraternal organizations, mutual aid societies, anything, part of their mandate is this struggle against slavery. And it's not surprising. 
right? Because many people have family members who are in slavery. Many people have friends who are still in slavery. Many people can remember being in slavery themselves. And, of course, the church. The church was, was the center of any anti-slavery or other organization. Any meetings, large meetings were held in the churches. The church was the place where you could gather in addition to a lot of other functions. But Jim mentioned before, barbershops serving as a place of getting the word out, of educating people, as well as being places where people found out about work, where they bought tickets to concerts, where they did almost anything. Grocery stores. You know, each community institution that you find serves another function. Grocery stores were kind of lending institutions for a population that couldn't go to the bank and get loans. You could run a tab at the grocery store. And so we found people, when they enlisted in the Civil War, uh, had to go to the grocery store and pay off their debts before they could go. So what we found in all of this not, was not surprising then that with all of this organization, this small number of people, a few thousand people, was actually able to maintain a fight against slavery, a formally organized fight against slavery for over 50 years. I mean, we're talking generations here of protest and organization because they were so densely organized, contrary to what Moynihan and Glazer and others had, had said in the beginning, once we got into the, the documents, we found this incredible organization that made sense then of why Boston and New England became such important centers for abolitionist activity. And that organization became the foundation for the activism that occurred and that moved apace in the 1850s. The 1850s is a critical moment. The 1850s was a time when blacks in Boston, in Nantucket, in a variety of places in the country started to become and to express a greater militancy than they had before. Especially this is true in Boston where blacks were under the influence to a great extent of white abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison. Garrison is terribly important. Garrison is the one white person who would say the things that needed to be said and would be listened to because he was a white person saying them. And African Americans were really devoted to Garrison. Garrison was a pacifist. He was a strong and radical abolitionist, but he was not a believer in violence. And for most of the period before the 1850s, blacks in Boston, there were a few exceptions, a few exceptional incidents, but for most of the time before the 1850s, African Americans in Boston were willing to go along with Garrison. They had great respect for him and they were willing to follow, at least to some extent, to a great extent actually, his, his uh, pacifist philosophy. 1850 is a tremendously important turning point. The Compromise of 1850. This was America's last attempt to compromise its greatest contradiction. Think about the contradiction here. A nation based on the concept of human freedom is the nation that sanctions human slavery. What greater, conf uh, what greater um, contradiction, not to say hypocrisy, could you find? 1850, Americans tried to compromise yet again this issue of slavery. And in this Compromise of 1850, they, they tried to pass a number of measures that would satisfy lots of different interests on this, on this issue. You know, this was such a, this was such a uh, controversial compromise, it could not all be passed in one bill. There were a series of individual bills that were passed. So there was a bill to admit California as a free state. Incidentally, let me just make this point, except by two votes. California's legislature or California's constitutional convention would have brought the state in as a slave state. Except by two votes, the constitutional convention would have brought the state in as a state 
that would refuse to allow free blacks to settle in within its borders. So for those in California, it's not, it's, it's not all good news. But it did come in as a free state. Uh, the compromise abolished the slave trade, not slavery, but the slave trade in Washington, D.C. The compromise, one of the most controversial parts of the compromise was a new fugitive slave law. This was the most harsh fugitive slave law that America had ever passed. This fugitive slave law gave a person accused of being a fugitive no right of jury trial, no right to a lawyer, no right to speak in their own defense. Think about how precarious your life was if you were a free black person who was accused of being a slave and you couldn't defend yourself. Nor could you depend on going to trial in which you could defend yourself. From the standpoint of free blacks all over the country, particularly from the standpoint of free blacks in Boston who were committed to doing everything they could in, the, in, in, in a city which had already a national reputation as an anti-slavery city, as a strong abolitionist city. Think about the impact of that. African Americans saw this as a kind of federal assault on their freedom, and they reacted. In the early 1840s, there had been a call for rebellion among slaves in the South and a call for free blacks in the North to take part in the rebellion. This was uh, a call issued at a convention in Buffalo in 1843. Henry Highland Garnett had issued the call. He put it up for a resolution. It had failed. Two people who had voted against doing that, against that resolution. One, Charles Lennox Ramon, Boston. The other, Frederick Douglass, with the time living in Lynn, Massachusetts. The issue is interesting. The fugitive slave law changes minds. It is Frederick Douglass who was so bent on being a Garrisonian in the early 40s who by the early 1850s was saying, the streets of Boston will run red with blood before the first slave is taken. And who said, the way to make, the, the, the way to discourage the enforcement of the fugitive slave law is to make a few dead fugitive slave catchers. What the point I'm trying to make here is that there was a rising militancy in the black community. People were vowing that no slave would be taken from the North, but especially from the city of Boston. Robert Morris went to New Bedford and he said, if a slave, hold, a slave catcher comes among you, you call us. We'll come down from Boston 500 strong and we won't leave until the man is safe. And so what we're seeing here is rising determination to defend fugitives. The, the Underground Railroad, it, we can talk about the Underground Railroad, and it's a, it's a very complicated phenomenon. But the Underground Railroad really kicks into high gear from the standpoint of northern cities and the willingness to protect fugitives after the fugitive slave law. And in this city, you know about some of the celebrated cases. You know about the cases of the crafts. You know about the case of Anthony Burns. Anthony Burns, incidentally, is one of those who has actually returned from Boston to the South, to slavery. Uh, eventually, blacks in, in Boston were able to raise enough money to buy his freedom. But the point is, the fact that he could be returned from the strongest supporting community of abolition in the country was a sobering experience. It was a major turning point. Throughout the 1850s, what you find is growing militancy on the part of blacks generally, on the part of abolitionists generally. You also find the willingness to use violence in a variety of ways against slavery. 1854, you got the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Historians have argued, and I think there's some truth to it, that the Civil War started in Kansas. Bleeding Kansas was not called that for no reason. First time you ever heard about John Brown was in Kansas. In 1857, Dred Scott has been for years fighting through lower cases, uh, lower courts, on the issue of his freedom. 
He claimed his freedom. He was a slave in Missouri who had lived for years outside of the territory in which slavery was legal. And he claimed that when he came back to Missouri, he should be free because he had lived outside of Missouri for so long. Well, at one level he won, he lost at a higher level, and so on. He got to the Supreme Court. 1857, he goes to the Supreme Court. By the way, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court is Roger B. Tawney a, uh, from a slaveholding family in the South. Roger B. Tawney literally reads his opinion out loud over two hours. He reads his opinion. And his opinion has a lot of stuff in it. It says that the, that the Congress has no right to outlaw slavery from the territories. Slavery is getting stronger and stronger. But the other thing he says is, Dred Scott is not free because Dred Scott has no right to the court system because Dred Scott is not a citizen of the United States. And then he says, no African American has ever been, is now, or can ever be a citizen of the United States and as such have no rights which white men are bound to respect. Well, militancy. Charles Lennox Ramon standing before a group in Philadelphia says in response to the Dred Scott decision, we owe no allegiance to a nation that grinds us under its iron heel and treats us like dogs. The time has gone by for black men to speak of patriotism. We're talking anger. Anger because African Americans have never been citizens of the United States, even though African Americans 5,000 strong fought for, to bring the United States into existence in the American Revolution. African Americans have never been citizens of the United States, even though African Americans fought to keep America independent and strong in the War of 1812. How could you tell this to these people? Well, this gives you some example of the rising militancy, the rising commitment to do something. In the, in the mid-1850s, in the city of Boston, blacks formed a militia company in anticipation of the fact that there would be a war and the war would be fought to end slavery. This is 1856. I mean, this is a long time before the war starts in 61. They're anticipating this. When John Brown goes to Harper's Ferry, he is supported by a number of blacks who are, in, who are from Boston, although there are blacks with him, but no, no Boston blacks with him. But blacks in Boston provide him with a great deal of support. There are lots of blacks in this city who know about the raid a long time before it happens. And so when the Civil War finally comes, when Abraham Lincoln calls for volunteers after the firing on Fort Sumter, African Americans in Boston, African Americans in New York, African Americans in Cincinnati and Pittsburgh and a variety of places where military companies have been at work drilling, training for five or more years, offer their services. They're ready. They're turned down immediately. And it isn't until the casualty rate mounts to the extent that is unbelievable, not until so many Americans are killed in that war that it becomes obvious to Lincoln and to others African-American military strength is needed. Frederick Douglass says it. He says, why is it Uncle Sam is trying to fight a war in which he needs all of his strength with one hand tied behind his back? From the standpoint, from Lincoln's standpoint, what he's trying to do is to not alienate the border states. You know, Lincoln says, I would like God on my side, but I must have Maryland and, 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 uh, <laughs> and Kentucky. Well, the fact is that it becomes inevitable, unavoidable. They need, they need the manpower. The 54th Regiment formed here in, in Boston, which, by the way, brings people from all over the country. Not, it, it's, a, it's a Massachusetts Regiment, but there are people here from uh, Michigan, from Pennsylvania, from a variety of places that come to join the 54th. When they march off to war, they are marching off to provide that level of manpower that the United States needs to win that war. And here's the irony. These are non-citizens. The Supreme Court has said these people are not citizens of the United States, yet they are going to give their lives to preserve the United States. This is the history 
of the black community in Boston. This is the history of black communities all over the North. Free people who are committed to the nation as only true patriots can be committed to the nation, com committed to a nation not committed to them, who are willing to give their lives to make the nation what it announced that it was in its inception. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Do you realize that black people took that seriously? They didn't realize that Thomas Jefferson was kidding when he said that. They didn't realize that all this was just for show. And when people talked about America being committed to freedom, they took it seriously and they wanted to help America in every way they could to fulfill that commitment. Now, that's the story of black people, free black communities all over the North. It is the story of black Boston. It is the story of blacks in Nantucket. It is a story I think that we know too little about and the story that you can help your students to, 